Hello everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we begin a new book of the Bible. We're in 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles, Old Testament book following 1st and 2nd Kings, continues the historical study of Israel. And 1 Chronicles uh, really repeats, and uh, from a little different angle, uh, what we've already looked at in uh, first and second kings so it's kind of a some review but like i said a little different angle so open up your bible to the old testament book of first chronicles and we'll begin in just a minute the scripture verse by verse website can be found at the bible verse by verse.com that's the bible verse by verse.com and you can study first chronicles or any other book of the bible begin in genesis go all the way through revelation if you want all 66 books of the bible three complete series through the bible 30 years of archives at the bible verse by verse.com and you can study it the way we're doing it today using my audio bible messages so i i hope that you take advantage of it because there's nothing more important than the word of god and uh even god said that he exalts his word above even his own name. That's how important it is. Jesus always pointed people to the Word of God, so it's important to study the whole counsel of God, too, <laughs> not just bits and pieces here and there. Well, let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings on our study here in First Chronicles and on our study today that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now, to begin, well, let's, let's read just the first few verses, and we'll see where this is headed. Begins way back in the beginning with Adam. Chronicles is a genealogy. A lot of it is, at least the first nine chapters. And it begins, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth. Let's stop there. This is one of the few places in Scripture where I will deviate from verse by verse and just summarize. And you will thank me. Because chapters 1 through 9 trace the genealogy of God's Old Testament people, Israel, beginning from Adam going to the restoration after the exile that we looked at in Second Kings when they were exiled into Babylon. Because of their sin, just by way of review, because of their sin, the nation had been conquered by Babylon. When they were conquered, the Holy Temple was destroyed. And they had no king from David's family on the throne when they returned. So the purpose for this book is to show the restored people of Israel, is to show them their continuity with their past. They were gone in exile for 70 years. Chronicles lists the genealogy to show that the nation and their people were still intact. The records were still there. And we pick up our study in chapter 10 after this genealogy. And we're going to pick it up right before David comes to power. We're going to pick it up during the last days of King Saul, Israel's first king, and his death how he was defeated by the Philistines. So let's pick it up in chapter 10, verse 1. Now the Philistines, if, if you've been with us from the beginning, you know the Philistines were Israel's arch enemies. These guys were scuffling all the time. And it says the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. Now whenever you see in the Old Testament... God's people losing a war or losing a battle. Mark this down. It's not because they were outnumbered. 
It's not because they were outgunned. It's because Israel was not walking with the Lord. Otherwise, they would never lose a battle because God would fight for them. Well, they're being routed by the Philistines because their king Saul is an ungodly man and the people were suffering because of it. And so we see that. They were being routed by the Philistines. The Israelites tried to escape, but instead many were wounded and many were killed. And we see in verse 2, And the Philistines followed hard after Saul and after his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, the sons of Saul. And the Philistines went after King Saul and his sons too. Above all, they wanted to destroy the royal line to create chaos and confusion. Little did they know that God had already picked Saul's successor. And it was a different dynasty. It had nothing to do with the, uh, with the uh, uh, sons of Saul. Verse 3. And the battle went severely against Saul. And the archers hit him, and he was wounded by the archers. He was terrified, too. And you can imagine, as the enemy approached Saul, just how filled with terror he was. And with good reason, it is because God had left Saul long ago. And that's because Saul had left God. Saul was on his own, with no help from God, because Saul turned his back on God. Now, if he would have turned back to God and repented, God probably would have helped him here. If nothing else, he would know that God was on his side. At least he had peace. He would have peace with God, no matter what happened. But he didn't have God in his life. So you don't have God in your life, and you're faced with death. You are in trouble. You had to live your life with the moment of your death in mind. And govern your life with the moment of your death in mind. Prepare for it. I've been doing I got saved 38 years ago as I make this program. And for 38 years, I've been living my life with my death in mind. Doing my best. I haven't always succeeded, but that's been my goal. Verse 4. Then said Saul to his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was very much afraid. So Saul took the sword and fell upon it. Saul didn't want the enemy to abuse him. Now maybe he thought they were going to torture him, mock him, or some other such thing before they killed him. He didn't want that, so he asked his armor bearer, his assistant, to kill him. His assistant wouldn't do it. Because even though he was a wretched, miserable king, he was still God's anointed. And he would not do it. He would not commit murder. No mercy death here. And so Saul committed suicide. Checked out that way. Verse 5. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise on his sword and he died. Well, you know, Saul... He's under a lot of pressure. Suicide is a sin. People commit suicide for a lot of reasons. Saul did it because he didn't want to be tortured. And he knew he was going to die anyway. And uh, his assistant, his armor bearer, followed suit. Which is kind of sobering when you think about it, isn't it? Because it's a reminder that we all influence other people. Our behavior influences other people's behavior. Whether we realize it or not, we do have some kind of influence, either good or bad. Verse 6, So Saul died, and his three sons, and all his house died together. The whole works, for the most part, was wiped out. The king died with all of his near relatives. Verse 7, And when all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that they were they who were in excuse me let's read it again and when all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that they saw that they fled and that Saul and his sons were dead 
Then they forsook their cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. So the Philistines take control of many of these cities in Israel. The army's gone. The army is scattered. And the Philistines now take control and set up forts right in the middle of Israel. And with that, and the death of Saul, you have the punishment of God for the disobedience of the king, who was bound and determined to do things his way instead of God's way, and it ended in a disaster. And it ended in his death, humiliating, confusion. A person is a fool to determine within themselves to live their way instead of God's way. It's going to end in disaster. There are no exceptions. It is the most ridiculous, the most stupid thing in the world to live your life apart from the Lordship of Jesus Christ and apart from the Word of God. You say, I don't like God because he didn't answer one of my prayers one time. So, so, so you're going to think you're punishing him? He's God. He's Lord. He's not the cause of trouble. And you're just going to bring more trouble on yourself by opposing. You're going to lose that battle. You, you fight against God, you're going to lose it. The testimony of Scripture is replete. It is filled with examples, after examples, after examples, of people who fought against God and lost including Lucifer. Notice verse 8. And it came to pass on the next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. So the battle is over. <clears throat> the Philistines take it easy. They come out the next day. They go into the uh, battlefield and they they're searching through the bodies of the dead Israelites looking for valuables, anything they can take as a, you know, spoils of war. And boy, they found themselves a couple of bonuses or a few bonuses. They searched the dead Israeli soldiers, and they got a real bonus when they discovered that among the dead was King Saul and his sons. Verse 9. And when they had stripped him, talking about Saul, the king, they took his head and his armor bearer and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to carry tidings unto their idols and to the people. So the Philistines, completely mistaken about how this happened, they praised their idols for their victory over King Saul and Israel. Little did they know that Saul's defeat had nothing in the world to do with their gods beating up Israel's gods. But that's what they thought. Saul's defeat, Israel's defeat, was allowed by God as punishment for Saul's sin. That's what it amounted to. That, that's it. Verse 10. And they put his armor in the house of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. So they took Saul's armor and his head and they put it in the temple of their false god, Dagon, thinking that it was somehow sort of like a, a trophy for their nothing god, Dagon. That's what they believed. Verse 11. And when all Jebus Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, Jebus Gilead, by the way, was a city an Israelite city that was outside the mainland of Israel, east of the Jordan River. Remember, there were three, two and a half tribes that settled east of the Jordan River before they crossed and entered into the Holy Land proper. Jebesh Gilead was one of those cities on the east side of the river. They heard what, what happened to Saul and his sons. And it says in verse 12, They arose, all the valiant men, and took away the body of Saul, 
and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jebesh and buried their bones under the oak of Jebesh and fasted seven days. And the seven days were a sign of mourning. Verse 13, So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of a medium to inquire of her. When Saul got word that he was going to lose the battle against the Philistines, he should have repented. Or he knew he was in hot water before he even got word about that. And he went and he consulted the Philist or the uh, a medium, which God had outlawed the sin to go to a medium or to a cultist or something like that. That's, that's all sin. God hates that stuff. If Saul, when he felt pressure, would have fallen on his knees, repented of his sins, and turned to God, he would have been saved, and he would have had peace, and maybe God, maybe God would have even spared him. But he died, and the Israelite army lost, because Saul was rebellious against God. And that's the long and short of it. Saul rejected the word of God, which is the same as rejecting God himself. See, when, when you and I study the word of God, when I proclaim the word of God, and you reject the word of God, you're not rejecting me. You can turn the TV off. You can turn the radio off if you want to. But you're not going to hurt my feelings. And you're not even going to offend me. You can cuss me out if you want to. You're not going to offend me. This isn't about me. I'm just a delivery boy. That's all. I'm just the courier. You're rejecting God. You're cussing God. You reject the word of God. You're rejecting God. And then foolish Saul was in so much hot water with God because he had turned his back on him for such a long time. When he felt the pressure, he went and he sought advice from a fortune teller, teller instead of God. So that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And for that, he was punished. He rejected God. He sinned against God, which is something that everybody does. We all sin against God. But Saul's problem was he refused to repent. And so God rejected him. You refuse to repent, God's going to reject you. Let's go into chapter 11. Then all Israel gathered themselves to David at Hebron, saying, Behold, we are thy bones and thy flesh. David had already reigned over a portion of Israel for seven years. And here, the entire country unites behind him. This is a real turning point in the nation Israel. Now, God has a man on the throne that he can trust. Hmm. Not entirely, but he does have a man on the throne who loves him, who has a heart for God. And David, even with all of his flaws, will be the standard by which God measures all future kings. Then all Israel gathered themselves to David at Hebron, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And then it says in verse 2, And moreover, in time past, even when Saul was king, thou wast he who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord thy God said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people, Israel, and thou shalt be ruler over my people, Israel. It had become common knowledge, even though Saul was still king, it had become common knowledge throughout Israel that God, through the prophet Samuel, had declared that Saul and his dynasty was coming to an end and would be replaced by David which is why Saul tried to kill David for several years. So everybody knew it. 
So when Saul is dead, the people come together and say, well, David, this is what God said was going to happen. You're our king, so you're our king. Verse 3. Therefore came all the elders of Israel to the king at Hebron. And David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel, according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. So representatives from all over the country made David the king on behalf of all the people. This was the will of God. The nation is now in the will of God and being led by a man who loves God. Verse five or verse four. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, were. The heathen Jebusites maintained their place in Jerusalem. That land, that city, had belonged to God's people. God gave it to them. But the Jebusites maintained, as I said, their place in Jerusalem, even after the conquest of the promised land by the Israelites. For some reason, they were not driven out of that. But look at, look at verse 5. And the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, Thou shalt not come here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, which is the city of David. I, I, I just love that. This is exactly what I was talking about a few minutes ago. Remember I said, the scripture is replete with examples of people who fought against God and the word of God and how they lost every single one of them. Here you go. Look at five again. And the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, thou shalt not come here. Oh, really? God said he was going to give that entire land to his people. And now that David is on the throne, he has no reason not to give them that victory. So the inhabitants of Jebus arrogantly say to David, Thou shalt not come here. And I love the next word. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, which is the city of David. Talk all you want. Talk smart all you want. God's word's still going to come to pass. You're going to lose that argument every single time. You're going to lose that war every single time. And so the Jebusites, oh, they had a great self-image, you know that? Oh, they were overconfident, saying, you're not going to take this city, David. And they can talk all they want. David took it because God was with them. Verse 6, and David said, Whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. Well, he needed a general for his army now that he's king. So he throws us out there. Verse 1, to smite the Jebusites gets to be my general. So Joab, the son of Zariah, went up first and was chief. He earned his position. Joab became the general of David's army. 7, and David dwelt in the stronghold. Therefore, they called it the city of David. And he built the city round about, even from Milo round about. And Joab restored the rest of the city. So the city was built out, actually, from the fortress where David lived. And the reason it was built out is to give the king greater security. Verse 9. So David grew greater and greater. For the Lord of hosts was with him. David put his trust in God. See, and consequently, God did not let him down. You know what the Bible says? I, I pray this prayer before I get out of bed every morning. Before my feet touch the ground, I say this to God. Father, it is better to trust in you than it is in man. It is better to trust in you than it is the government. It is better to trust in you than in the things of this world. Father, today I offer you a sacrifice of righteousness and I put my trust in you. Let me not be ashamed for no one who puts their trust in you 
shall ever be put to shame. Then I'm ready to get out of bed. And we see, you put your trust in God, you're not going to be put to shame. Again, verse 9, so David grew greater and greater, for the Lord of hosts was with him. David put his trust in God. He obeyed God. He offered God a sacrifice of righteousness. He obeyed God. He put his trust in God, and consequently, God did not let him down, and God will not let you down, down either. Verse 10, these also are the chief of the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him in his kingdom and with all Israel to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. So David's mighty men were the great soldiers who stood with him throughout his in entire reign. He could trust them. And uh, I'm not going to read all these names because it's really just another list of names of David's mighty men that he could count on. And uh, the rest of this chapter does list that elite group of men, his soldiers, known as his mighty men. So if you ever want to know where, who they are, you can check it out. I'm going to skip chapter 11, therefore, and I'm going to go to chapter 12. But you know what I'm going to do? We're going to begin the meat of this book in chapter 12. We've just kind of laid the foundation, okay? So next time we'll get into the meat, and I think you're going to like it. I think you're going to have fun. It's the Word of God's greatest thing on earth. But we're going to stop right here. It's a good place to stop. So, um, But you don't have to stop. As I say every time, at the end of every broadcast, you can continue studying the Word of God if you want to at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Feel free to go there and begin a verse-by-verse -verse study with me through the entire Bible. Either begin in Genesis and go through all the Bible, which I really do encourage to get it all in context. Now, it's going to take you a while because it's not, it's not a chapter-by-chapter chapter or a paragraph-by-paragraph. Paragraph. It is verse-by-verse, verse. so it's going to take you a while. It took me on an average of 10 years to go through the Bible every time I did it. But you can do it at your pace, at your convenience at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, as I say on every broadcast, please remember, I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. I don't have the backing of any foundation or anything like this. For over 30 years as I have been doing this, I just give out the Word of God as clearly as I can, without watering it down, straightforward, the best that I possibly can, and trust people, the holy remnant, really, who love God's Word, and aren't interested in tinsel or fluff to support this ministry with their prayers and financial support. So I would appreciate both of those, believe me. You can be a part of this ministry with your prayers and financial support, and you can give right there at thebibleversebyverse.com by clicking the Donate button at the top of the front page and prayerfully giving as the Lord may lead. Or you can write Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin. 53074, Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. Thank you for spending this time with me. Appreciate it so much. Excited about this new book? I hope it's good stuff. The entire Bible is good stuff. And we'll pick it up right here next time. Until then, so long, everyone.